Enacted in 1978, John Paul II was the third longest serving Pope in history, after St. Peter and Pope Pius IX. John Paul II traveled to 129 countries and received more than a thousand political leaders, including heads of state and prime ministers. He was the most seen person in human history. That record was set in Manila in 1995 when an estimated 7 million young Filipinos gathered around John Paul II. There were people behind some walls that could not see. They did not even have a radio to listen to the Pope. But they said, the Pope is here and we could not miss it. Apart from being a traveler, Pope John Paul II was an untiring teacher. From his pen flowed more than 70,000 pages of magisterial documents, the equivalent of a 50-volume library. He delivered nearly 3,500 speeches and welcomed 18 million people in his Wednesday audiences. Each year, John Paul II gathered the collegial government of the church together, something that had not happened in nine centuries. He appointed nearly all the bishops in the church today and managed to meet each of them at least four times. Never has the church been more international. During his pontificate, Karol Wojtyla created 231 cardinals from 66 different countries. Este Papa será llamado Juan Pablo II Magno. This Pope will be called John Paul the Great because he was truly colossal. And for any observer, Catholic or not, who is objective, the imprint of this man has been colossal. Many also considered him the parish priest of the world. He revolutionized the image of the papacy and administered all the sacraments personally. He would sit in the confessionals of the Vatican Basilica, baptize, and even celebrate weddings. But the pontificate of John Paul II cannot be reduced to a few pages in the Guinness Book of Records. I have never seen his most important record mentioned. However, everyone depends on him. And what is that record? The hours that this Pope spends in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Yes, he was the Pope of the journeys and the crowds, but he was also the Pope of union with Christ and devotion to Mary. This, they say, was his secret. One of John Paul II's priorities was the unity of Christians. He wanted to build a strategic alliance between religions to bring about peace. His funeral was a global event. Around his tomb, the powerful of the world came in prayer, divided by conflicts, but united in their tribute to the Pope. Their presence recalled the first interreligious gathering called by the Pope in 1986 in Assisi for a common prayer for peace. John Paul II also made an irreversible impulse towards reconciliation between Christianity and Judaism. He became the first pope to enter a synagogue. La religione ebraica non ci è estrinseca, ma in un certo qual modo è intrinseca alla nostra religione. Abbiamo quindi verso di essa dei rapporti che non abbiamo con nessun'altra religione. Siete i nostri fratelli prediletti e in un certo modo si potrebbe dire i nostri fratelli maggiori. Eh, io non mi aspettavo. I was very moved because I did not expect that the Pope would come to me with open arms. And when he hugged me, at that moment I felt that something was changing, that an era had come to an end and that a new one was beginning. Finiva un'epoca e ne iniziava un'altra. In 1993, the Vatican recognized the State of Israel and 
diplomatic relations were established. Le Pape a fait un travail extraordinaire. The Pope has done an extraordinary job with great intelligence, faith, and charisma, which will bring about countless fruits. Qui a des conséquences incalculables. But the real milestone was John Paul II's historical pilgrimage to the Holy Land. With now Pope John Paul II's visit to the Holy Land, giving fullest respect to its highest elected officials at state reception, standing at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial, in tearful solidarity with Jewish pain and suffering, going to the Western Wall, the Kotel, putting there the text of a prayer he composed, asking for God's forgiveness for the sins committed by Christians down the ages against the people who he calls God's people, the children of Abraham, God's people of the original covenant, never broken and never to be broken. I mean, that's an amazing transformation. The Pope's pastoral mission reached even Muslim countries. In 2001, in Damascus, he set another milestone, becoming the first pontiff to enter a mosque. Never before had any state, monarchy, or great institution apologized for all the human tragedies throughout history. But John Paul II was convinced that in order to preach with legitimacy, the church had to recognize its mistakes. He called it the purification of memory. So on more than 100 occasions, he apologized for the darkest chapters in Catholicism's history. Public opinion, certain media, have criticized this Pope for a thousand things, but nobody has criticized him for not being consistent in terms of what he says and what he does. In 1979, he apologized for the injustices against Galileo Galilei. A year later, he acknowledged the reasons that led Luther to rebel against a corrupt church. He made history visiting Rome's synagogue, where he condemned all forms of anti-Semitism. In Athens, he apologized for the sacking of Constantinople and on Gore Island for the slave trade. It was John Paul II himself who insisted on including a ceremony of global petition of forgiveness in the Jubilee 2000. On that occasion, the Catholic Church produced a global mea culpa for all its injustices a resolution that astonished the high spheres of the Vatican Curia and the most conservative sectors of the Church. Why was John Paul II apologizing for the mistakes Catholics made centuries ago? It doesn't refer to the past in itself, but to the past in the sense that it makes us reflect on the future. There have been acts committed in the past which must never occur again. This is a difficult issue, but this Pope was convinced that apologies had to be made, because since we all share the same faith, we also share sin with our brothers. The Pope entrusted this issue to an international commission of theologians. They had to study deeply each and every mistake made by the Church along its history. We told ourselves the first thing to do is a serious historical study because apologies should be made for facts, real sins. The study culminated with the Jubilee ceremony in which John Paul II apologized for the Inquisition, for the schisms, and for anti-Semitism. In what constituted one of the most important acts of his pontificate, he also included faults against peace, the rights of peoples and the person, and the dignity of women. And the Pope himself approved the text. He added some things. The Pope really had his heart in this celebration. A petition which included a resolution not to sin again. With neither excuses nor justifications, the Church committed not to resort again to the logic of violence. 
It helps Catholics to achieve what the Pope called the purification of memory. That is, to have a true outlook on the past, not an apologetic attitude which tries to more or less justify things that are not justifiable. The Pope does not say it out of politeness, but I will say it. Others should also admit the sins they have committed. In order for two groups to reconcile, it takes humility on both sides. The Jubilee ceremony was not only a petition of forgiveness for John Paul II. That same day, he wanted to forgive all those who in some way had attacked, persecuted or martyred Christians throughout history.